Good afternoon, good afternoon. Hello, everyone. Good to have you with us. Thank you so much for joining us once again to a forum for the Metropolitan Club. It is good to have you with us. What a topic we have today. Uh, my name is Matt Barnes, morning co-anchor for NBC4 today and a proud CMC Board of Trustee member. Also, take a look at those forum flyers that you have on your table. There you'll see the many fantastic organizations that support the not-for-profit Metropolitan Club. Uh, speaking of great organizations that uh, support CMC. We'd like to thank today's sponsors, uh, our friends at CODA right there, the United Way of Central Ohio, the Robert Weiler Company. Thank you so much for supporting today's forum. We're also always grateful to the Center of Human Kindness at the Columbus Foundation and the Columbus Dispatch for presenting today's live stream, which is being carried on all of CMC's social media platforms. And thank you as well to our hosts, the Grange Insurance Audubon Center, for their ongoing support for CMC. Let's thank all of those for supporting. And now for today's conversation, this is a good one, I think. Uh, the development of many American cities has been shaped by redlining. It's a banking and lending practice dating back to the 1930s by dividing urban, uh, urban areas primarily by race. It placed minorities at a severe disadvantage when trying to obtain mortgages or insurance with devastating consequences for property owners, families, and neighborhoods. So today we're gonna look at the history and impact of redlining right here in Columbus and the new efforts to heal its deep divisions. To introduce our esteemed panel in front of me and our moderator and set the stage for our conversation, please welcome Deputy CEO Monica Tejas Fowler from today's forum sponsor, CODA. Monica. Hello, everyone. It's a privilege, privilege to join you this afternoon as we learn about a very important topic that has continued to impact many people in central Ohio and communities across the country for decades. As a new deputy CEO at CODA, I'm learning how redlining and mobility access impacted Columbus neighborhoods and how our organization is part of a new effort to correct these historical injustices. We don't have to dig deep to understand how systemic racism destroyed and reshaped neighborhoods and dislocated re residents. Not far from where we are today is Interstate 70. During its construction in the 1960s, the highway cut through Har Hanford Village, destroying homes, upending families, and devastating a proud middle class, dominantly black neighborhood. Meanwhile, govern government policies and practices along the highway, engineers of that time found ways to circumvent areas of, of affluence. Going back further was the practice of redlining, providing and denying personal and business loans to customers based on their zip codes and ultimately their race. In the mid-1930s, a federal agency created maps for every major city, including Columbus, to define which areas were safe to provide loans and which area came with what were labeled as higher risks. Most red line neighborhoods were populated by black Columbus residents, including those who, who were financially secure, and even those who were wealthy. As with so many of the tools and policies that have been used to disenfranchise people of color, the consequences of redlining are still with us today. A loan denied to a family of color, a neighborhood disconnected by a freeway, and deliberately racist federal and local policies created these injustices that reverberate for generations. While transit cannot itself right all these wrongs, it does have a role to play. Our CODA transit vehicles create connections to and from these neighborhoods that have been historically intentionally marginalized. These connections are important, but they're not enough. And as the mobility solutions provider of this region, we recognize transit must also improve to offer access to prosperity. The decisions we make today to shape our future tomorrow, we do, what we do over the next year or two will define our future and the future of our children and grandchildren. The opportunity for Central Ohio to reimagine the way we live and the way we move is coming before us. If we do not seize this opportunity, our inaction will echo for generations, just as the redlining and other discriminatory policies of the 20th century haunt us today. 
Over the next year, you will hear more about the Link Us initiative, which is an opportunity for us to redefine transit and mobility in central Ohio. CODA, the City of Columbus, the Franklin County Board of Commissioners, and the Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Commission are partners in leading this initiative that can reconnect our communities and boldly reimagine the way we move and the way we live. The growth we are now experiencing presents a challenge, but also forces us to act. We can no longer pretend that these issues of mobility, housing, and equity can be addressed down the road. We must address them now. And the good news is that we can. And now, it's my great honor to welcome today's speakers. Jordan Miller, co-founder, CEO, and chair of Adelphi Bank. Filling in for Franklin County Auditor Mike Stiziano, who could not be with us today due to scheduling conflict, is Monica Moran, Deputy Chief of Staff with the Auditor's Office. <laughs> Nicole Sutton, Black Heritage Special Collections Librarian for the Columbus Metropolitan Library. and Danielle Sidnor, CEO of the Rise Together Innovation, Innovation Institute. <laughs> and our host, Tracy Townsend, news anchor for, of Wake Up CBUS and TV, 10 TV News at noon on WBNS 10 TV. You can read more about today's speakers in your forum flyers. Tracy, we look forward to today's conversation. Good afternoon. Had to put the water down. I'm sure we're going to need to drink a lot of water today. I hope everybody is ready for a great discussion. I'm going to move the mic so it's not popping. Just a, okay. All right. Uh, we're going to have a really great conversation here about redlining. Uh, this is a very wonderful panel, so I don't think there will be any gaps or pauses. And that's always good, because we don't like those in TV time and TV land or live stream land. So let's first just jump right in with sort of a, let's do a, like, a sort of a baseline definition of redlining. And I was going to go to you, uh, Nicole, to kind of start us off with that. Sure. To put it simply, redlining was the federally instituted practice of segregating American cities based on race or ethnicity of the residents of those cities. Did you say federally instituted? Federally I just you to instituted. Repeat that. Let me repeat that. Federally instituted. Does anybody else want to weigh in on the federal institution of redlining before I move on? Yeah, I would say that the federal institution, I mean, it, the FHA uh, was the primary driver of this, and they were doing it strictly to keep the races apart. Okay, yep. Um, so can you talk about why the practice existed. I think, Jordan, you kind of gave us, gave us the answer in a nutshell, but can we kind of peel back a layer on that? Yeah, so the redlining uh, and the FHA, the idea was to have a federally, a federally insured mortgage, uh, so to provide mortgages for families, so then that was, that was the big rollout. And so they came up with guidelines uh, on, for cities to how to institute and how to assess risk in their communities. And so, uh, the, the, the communities themselves got color-coded by the local officials, so blue and green were the good areas, yellow was declining, and red was uh, <clears throat> the hazardous areas, so and basically telling banks you should not lend in these areas, which, and, and, and most people, they, they followed those guidelines. The Homeowners Loan Corporation was the program that was started under FDR's administration in the 1930s who created the maps. And as Jordan said, uh, green was good, that was grade A, that was the, the lowest risk, and then underneath that was blue, and that was still desirable, that's the designation. Yellow after that was definitely declining, and then red after that was labeled hazardous. And how did you get a red area or a red-lined area? There would be uh, black people there, Hispanics there, or 
in the beginning, there were uh, foreign-born immigrants is the way that they phrased it. So that was the Irish, the Italians, and Jewish people. If they had a presence there, it was considered that they were infiltrating that area and it was considered hazardous. So again, it was based on race or ethnicity of the residents there. Not necessarily, again, like Monica said, the wealth or the, the stability of the neighborhood. It was based on race and ethnicity. So uh, you can tell Nicole is an expert. So I want to um, have her talk more about the Black Heritage Special Collection and the display that you helped. Um, and let's find out how many people did get to see Undesigned the Red Line by show of hands. Oh, I love an educated crowd. This is great. <laughs> well, can you talk more about your role with that? Absolutely. I was on uh, the planning committee for the Undesigned the Red Line interactive exhibit. So this is a, a national campaign, uh, Designing the We created it, and it has gone to multiple uh, cities in the U.S. And when it came here to Columbus, Designing the We worked with, always works with a local organization, and here it was YWCA Columbus and the lovely people there. <laughs> and we worked with them to bring in uh, all of the information for Columbus specific so that on the exhibit you had the general information that was true for the entire nation, because again, this was a federally instituted for the entire of entirety of the United States, but then look at how that specifically affected Columbus. And so that exhibit uh, has been to multiple places so far. Uh, it has been at the, the main library, which hopefully a lot of you saw it there. Uh, it is currently at the Upper Arlington uh, Concourse Gallery, and it'll be there until July 7th. Then after that, it's going to a couple of private showings, but then in September and October, it will be at the Worthington Community Relations Commission. And then there's talks that perhaps in November and December, it might go to Otterbein University or Westerville Public Library after that. Great. Can we talk about insurance and redlining and insurance? And anybody can jump in here. We, we're friends. Oh, I'll add in. Thank you. Um, the interesting part of redlining is we do spend a lot of time talking about its historical context as if, like, it totally went away when it ended. It didn't? Um, it didn't. Just, what we know that. now is it is shrouded in just different language mm -hmm. uh, that we don't as explicitly talk about it in the way that we did before. So when you do talk about insurance at the time of redlining, you had people who were living in the neighborhoods and communities. I think that's the other part is like from a lending perspective, we wouldn't give you a loan that was backed by the federal government, but it didn't mean you didn't have the need for capital to do improvements on your home uh, or to, to acquire the home in general. So that left and created a secondary predatory market of individuals that could then take advantage of you in a way that they couldn't if you were in a home and a mortgage that was backed by the federal government. And so insurance was another one of those practices where individuals were purchasing homes but then were unable to get homeowners insurance and other things on their properties. And so I think that the, what we see now are the evidence of that in many of our neighborhoods and communities that are being gentrified because those property values have continued to decline because you don't have the resources to fix your roof after the storm comes because you never had homeowner's insurance. Or you have to do it out of your own pocket in cash where your white neighbor might be able to pay a deductible and get a new roof. You've gotta come up with the whole amount of money yourself to take care of that. And what does that do for generations of dollars that you could spend on other things and you're simply burdened with the maintenance of a home when you've been sold home ownership as the American dream? Can you talk more, and, and, and again, everybody can jump in here, about how that affected families, particularly the families of color, the immigrant families that were, were here and in other parts of the country? The impact on families, like, just think of you couldn't buy a home. That's the biggest way to build wealth in this country. That's the number one way, and it's the number one way to pass genera generational wealth. So without the ability to own a home, you, you never had the ability to transfer that wealth. These communities were set up, though, so that there was intentional segregation. Uh, <clears throat> and the um, home uh, communities were built for white only all around the country, and they were built for black only all around the country. And you can imagine the separate but equal clauses in those kind of uh, uh, those housing areas where the, the white schools would be in, or the white homeowners would be in great neighborhoods. The black places would be in places that people were fleeing and trying to get out of. And so even when you could own a home in, in some of those neighborhoods, 
the values were very depressed, and the appraisals of those homes as they came back were even lower. So it's, it, it, it's systemic, and it, it has a major impact on families today. I think to build on that, what we saw is that missed opportunity to build generational wealth that happened years ago, so that was lost over the years. And now, as we look from a reappraisal perspective, even from the auditor's office, so we handle reappraisals, as we are reappraising properties and updating those values, we're seeing these neighborhoods who, who missed that opportunity on, on generational wealth now seeing an increase in those values that is a, a steeper increase. So now a family who missed that opportunity to build that generational wealth, you know, your home is your greatest asset, so property values going up is a good thing, but that is a steeper increase when you haven't been able, when you're on that fixed income or haven't been able to have that value over the course of years. So now as we're projecting over a 40% average increase in Franklin County, and for some areas that's 60 and 70% increase, absorbing that value increase all at once, particularly in black and brown or formerly redlined communities, we're now seeing an opposite impact and on those exact same families. And the auditor's office worked with Kerwin. Can you talk about how that sort of study, we're going to see that manifest itself soon with the results? Absolutely. So uh, when we took office in 2019, one of the first things our office looked at, because we, again, as we handle the, the appraisal part of this moving forward, we looked at what can we do? What change can we make? And certainly there's some limitations on government here, but our first thought was let's partner with the Kerwin Institute and let's look at working with other experts to say, how can we look at reappraisal through a racial equity lens? Give us recommendations on one, how was this done in the past? Two, how can we do it better? And there were very specific recommendations that we were given for our 2023 reappraisal, which has been we've been working on for the past two years. Those notices go out this year. And there were some very specific suggestions given from Kerwin in partnership with us. Uh, and one of those was to increase the number of delineated neighborhoods we have. So instead of looking at large chunks of neighborhoods, some of those that were larger red line neighborhoods, going and, and hyper-localizing that data so that it is more individualized, so that we can get better metrics on that and have more accurate and more fair data. So from 2017, that was 349 neighborhoods across Franklin County. So now in 2023, that'll be 1,037. So we are hyper-localizing that to try to change that impact. They recommended that we do something as simple as implicit bias training with our appraisers and our contract appraisers, right? That, that was a, you know, a, a simple thing that we could do to make sure that everyone who was looking at properties in Franklin County, especially because they often come in from outside of Franklin County on, on contract work, understand the community they're in, are trained, are paired up with someone who actually lives here. That was a big part of it. And the third one was to create an opportunity for Franklin County residents to weigh in on the front end on how they view their neighborhoods. So we instituted a neighborhood survey, which we did as from an organizing perspective out in person as well as online. So people could say, this is how I view my neighborhood. This is how I view my neighborhood, um, giving five different topics and metrics. And that way, if it lined up differently with what our appraisers were saying, we could say, you live here and here's how you say it. We are appraisers seeing it this way. Is there a disparity? And if so, we're gonna take a second look. And I think those are really important things to go and take those second looks and make sure that we are getting towards accuracy, but also fairness as much as possible. Can you tell us a little bit more about what the people who live there said and how the uh, appraiser, can you give us some specifics? I like, I wanna see hear that. Yeah. So. What was, what was actually, I don't want to know that it was surprising because I think it's a good thing. We found that there were very few, less than 15% of the actual survey results that showed any difference between what our appraisers would say and what neighborhood respondents said. And I will, I will give the, the disclaimer, we left this open to all residents. We thought it important that if you, even if you rented, that you be able to talk about your neighborhood, um, how you felt your neighborhood. Some of the questions were, um, about neighborhood resources such as community centers, conditions of streets, uh, access to services, hospitals, businesses, et cetera. So you may not own the property, but you live in the property. So there were some discrepancy if you lived there but didn't own the property because some of the property owners, I think, may want a slightly different outcome than the people that they rent to. <laughs> All that being said, we had our second look, and I, I believe they're still reconciling those numbers um, and we filed with the department. Uh, we filed with the Department of Tax about a week ago. So they will approve that. We'll know again if we have to take any second looks from there. But the number, the discrepancy, 
was quite low. So that gives us some reassurance that our training, our double up training, our double checks, and I think just the opportunity to participate, I think made a, a really big difference. So I'm, we're pretty proud of that, and I think that's a practice that we're gonna continue. And that was the training of the appraisers? That was the training of the appraisers, that was holding the neighborhood survey, and that was, th one, the training with the implicit bias training, and two, trying to pair up our um, contract appraisers with our in-office appraisers who are here and actually live here year-round. Whenever you conduct mass appraisal, um, there's not enough, there's, there's very few firms that can do it. You end up hiring a, a company that is generally not local. So how do you take folks from out of state and have them understand Franklin County and have them not read about a neighborhood and have some preconceived notion about it, right? So we were trying to partner them up so that there wasn't any preconceived judgment or notion about a neighborhood and make sure that that valuation was, again, without bias to the extent possible. It is a science. I think, uh, I, I think you described it very well. But I think when people see the impact of their property taxes going up, the homeowners in some of these communities, I think we're going to have some riots on our hands. I think, the, I think there's going to be a little bit of sticker shock. And you know, so our, our job this year is, is to remind people that when, when every property owner come August receives in the mail that new property value number, and I don't want to get too far from the redlining, but to my part on the reappraisal, when you get that number in the mail, you're going to, there is a pretty large increase. So we're doing our, our part to say, there, there's an increase here. Here's what you can do. There are several steps that you can do to work with our office on your value. So we've set up informal reviews across the county for the month of September. You can come and talk with us. Pretty high percentage of people who engage with our office um, are successful in seeing that value reduction. Some want an increase. Some, you know, some people are looking for an increase, but are successful in seeing that change because we don't go inside your house. And so we know that there's outside investors flipping homes. Maybe you know, to your point. Um, changing the houses, flipping the homes, redoing the kitchen, have the, the money to do a lot of those things. And then there's our neighbors who don't have that ability, bought that house, you know, um, maybe through predatory lending, bought it 50 years ago, haven't had the ability to keep it up, but we're looking at neighborhood structural properties on the outside. So where we can, we're doing informal reviews, letting uh, property owners come to us to say, here's what we think it should be, here's what, what could be different, trying to come to a, a better result there. Um, that's one option. And then also we are letting homeowners know about a couple of different programs to help them with property taxes should they need that assistance. Through our property tax assistance program, lobbying to increase the homestead exemption, all of those. None of those are enough, but the sticker shock is going to be real. It's going to be real. So um, let's talk about some other terms, block busting. Who wants to talk about block busting and the role it played in keeping neighborhoods segregated? A block busting was basically it was a scare tactic. You had uh, folks going out into the neighborhood saying, hey, your neighborhood is getting ready, to, a black person is getting ready to move in your neighborhood. You need to sell your home, scare the pants off of them. Oh, blacks are coming. Our property value is going down. Get out while we can. And, <clears throat> and they sold their houses at, to these folks at really low prices so that they could sell to the black folks that were moving in. Uh, it was very profitable for them as a scare tactic. Uh, and it worked. Move again. Yes. <laughs> yeah. They knew the blacks would pay more for housing. The blacks that were moving from the, especially from the agrarian south, right, in a great migration to come to the northern cities where there was quote unquote freedom, work where you want, play where you want, live where you want. You know, all of the American dreams that was supposedly open, only to find out that it wasn't true. And, and blockbusting was just one of those examples. <clears throat> Um, uh, things in the recent book I read called uh, Race for Profit, they talk about what it would be like if we actually had a free market system for housing. We've never truly had free market because you told black people they could move and live anywhere they wanted, but then you cordon people off into specific areas. And so they, again, you, you created this system where I could intentionally go in, I could buy homes, I can control the market, I can dictate who gets to move here, and you end up paying more for square feet for the same type of home than a person does in a suburban community, not because the house has any more value, but because somebody gets to control the market. And we wouldn't be okay if they did that with washing machines. But we were okay with people doing it in housing. And again, it still is something that persists today. We talk about density 
We don't say we don't want a lot of people of color. We just say we don't want density in our communities. Or we say we don't want overcrowding of schools, but we're saying the same thing. We just know we can't publicly say, I don't want black people, I don't want Jewish people, I don't want people of color in my neighborhood. And so how do we as community break down this coded language and get back to these root cause issues? So I wanna get us to some answers. Go ahead, go ahead, go <laughs> ahead. I know, go ahead. Mm -hmm. We have to talk about um, some other words, restrictive deeds and covenants. What about the, the effect there in Columbus? Is that a, a cold question? Okay. So restrictive covenants and also putting that language into deeds would, once those uh, segregated neighborhoods were created by the FHA only insuring bank mortgages for white families in racially segregated areas would then prevent black people from even in the future being able to then move into those areas because they would put in that language either in the deed for the house or the restrictive covenant for the area that only people of the white race can purchase these homes. So they would do that specifically so they could not. There's an example, uh, 71 Winter Avenue, which was a sanatorium, it was being sold, it was sold to the, uh, this is the name at the time, the old folks home of Franklin County, which was basically a black nursing home. And the neighborhood took them to court because it was not meant to be sold to anyone outside of the white race. And the courts upheld that. That was 1946. And that nursing home eventually turned into Isabel Ridgeway, which many of you are probably familiar with. Um, but yeah, that was 1946 and the courts were still upholding, yes, this is a racial covenant that says that you should not be living there. And eventually they were able to, to move into the house, but they had to pay high fines to do so. And when did, when did this become illegal, redlining? So redlining became illegal in 1968 with the Fair Housing Act, and that's, uh, it became illegal in policy, not in practice. Again, it just continued on for decades, but we just didn't say it anymore as, as quite as explicitly as they did in the past. Some of the ways they got around we formed homeowners associations in a lot of neighborhoods that were private homeowners associations, and so since they weren't really part of the federal government, they could, they could, they could, do a little bit more, and then it was more the homeowners association, kind of the secret behind, shake, you know, behind behind the scenes. You know, they could, uh, hey, talk to each other, and could say, hey, you know, here's what we kind of neighborhood we want to be, and give the coded language that these are the kind of folks that are desirable in our neighborhoods and not. And so they could enforce a lot of these uh, codes through uh, uh, restrictive governments in these neighborhood associations, and many neighborhoods <clears throat> uh, continue to, to practice as well into current state, basically. And Daniel, your background is in banking. That's for anybody who doesn't know that. Um, tell us about how the system works or doesn't work for people and neighborhoods. So I think about from a, from a banking and finance perspective, you know, even as Monica was talking about uh, the process of appraisal. So that's like a countywide appraisal for the land value assessments and things like that. But we continue to have situations across the country where individuals are selling their homes and they're getting appraisals that are far less than what their neighbors and other members of their communities are receiving because of their race. And this is supposed to be a colorblind process, right? Uh, and then they take down artifacts and images and pictures of their family and they have a white neighbor stand in for them and all of a sudden they get $200,000 more of appraisal for the same home. And so when, when we think about the visceral reaction that some people get when they get that appraisal in the mail from the county, part of it is because they don't believe in the uh, free market, they're going to get that same value when it's time for the lender to send an appraiser out to say, I wanna sell my home. Is it worth this amount that the county has said? I have a really good friend in Cleveland that went through a very similar situation and went back and forth. I won't name the bank because hopefully they worked the situation out, uh, but you had to really prove that this home that was in a predominantly inner city that has been gentrified is worth the $400,000 plus that it actually is. And so what does it mean for the stress of a resident that's simply trying to navigate, doing all the things they have to do in their day-to-day -day life, and then fighting with a big financial institution to get an appropriate value so they can send their kid to college, so they can start a business, so they can refinance other debt. Some of the things, again, that we say are really a part of how you should take advantage of our American economic system. And how, do, how does your role 
help people do that because I felt like the hair is on the back of my neck standing. I mean, because you think about it, you're right, we have to go to work, and then I got to remember to take down my African art because I want to sell my house. I got to bake cookies so it smells like cookies in there. I mean, <laughs> work is designed around system changes. I want to say uh, thank you to my board chair, Trudy Bartley, and board member Nana Watson for being here, because as a new organization, Rise Together Innovation Institute, started by our Franklin County Commissioners, to really look at why, as everybody in the county is starting to grow more economically, everybody is not faring equally. And we know that a significant portion of that is because of systemic racism and the systems that are at play. And so when we think about something like appraisals as being an issue, one of the things that we're designed to be able to do is say what system is undergirding that and what policies need to be changed, be it in the government sector or in the private sector, to really do that. So do we create a mechanism that allows a person to be able to go uh, and file a complaint? Like if we're getting an appraisal that is not on par with what the county auditor's office has already said, the value of that external land is available and have a mechanism to put some sort of kind of guardrails on the private sector if they're not doing what they're supposed to do. So we're looking at systems change. So I know you didn't say the bank that you were talking about, but I'm going to say this bank, Adelphi Bank. Anybody know about that one? <laughs> All right, so we need to hear the Adelphi story, and um, we'll, we'll listen to whatever you want to tell us. And get, tell us where it is. Okay, so I'll tell you. So it's in a historic neighborhood that was uh, part of, you know, what we call redlining, uh, the Lincoln uh, Lincoln, the Lincoln area, the Bronzeville area, uh, commonly called. It was, that's where the bank is located, right across from the historic Lincoln Theater, a, a neighborhood that was full of cultural arts, uh, business owners, uh, you know, everything that a family or community would want. And, but when it became redlined through these maps, it, it changed it. And then furthermore, when the freeways went through these redlined areas. That's exactly where I-71 went right through that area, went right through my neighborhood, Milo Grogan, went right through other areas, I-70, I-71, 670. They went right through the redlined areas. That was easy for them to, to go and say, hey, these are the areas where we should build these roads <clears throat> and, and disrupt more families. Uh, but Adelphi Bank was founded, uh, there was an Adelphi Bank that we were named after that was founded in 1921. The purpose of that bank was to help the migrants, or the African Americans who were moving from the South to the North to find homes, to find place to live, to, to, to help them with that transition. That, that bank went out of business at some point in time, but when we found out about that story, we decided that we would name our bank Adelphi since we're, we're, we're literally located on the same site. We named our bank Adelphi Bank. Adelphi means brothers. It's a Greek word. <clears throat> and we wanted to continue the story, or to finish the story, uh, to get uh, folks on this economic ladder to help them build their wealth, to help them you know, become productive citizens, do what everybody else in this room wants to do, which is grow their families, have their, grow their businesses, and, and uh, be an important part of community, and to, and to serve their neighbors. So that's why Delphi Bank was formed. Uh, come by, open up an account if you want. I see uh, one of our board members here, Alex. And I know I've got a <clears throat> Alex, Alex Shoemate, and then I know I've got an employee here, this Tara. She's, a, she's an underwriter, so if you need, a, you need help with your business loan application, she can underwrite it. She can tell you where the, where the holes are in your credit and, and help you get them fixed. How much of a difference do you think Adelphi can make? You know, I, I tell you, it would not, we could not make a difference if we didn't start. So and what I look at every day, I look at one person that we can help. If I can help one person understand a better way to buy an auto loan, how to cut, the, cut through the chase, how to one person to improve their credit score, one person that has a business that can hire more employees, one person that's on a supplier diversity program that, can, that, that, that the library needs to have more whatever they need, if I can supply them with capital and they can supply more of those prices so that the library can use them. That's, that's how I look at it. There is no impact if, the, if there is no Delphi. We're the 21st African-American-owned bank in the country right now. The, uh, we're the first one formed in over 20 years. <clears throat> the, um, the impact when I talk to the other banks that they're having in their communities is, is, is astronomical. Uh, for instance, um, <clears throat> there, there are tons of studies. I was on a, a study with um, the St. Louis Fed, uh, Federal Reserve Board, and the study shows that if 
a black person goes to another black person for service, they're more likely to get the service. So a black uh, person gets in front of a mortgage loan officer that's black is more likely to get the mortgage and less likely to default. So all that stuff is, is data, it's, it's out there. Uh, it's, it's very similar to an HBCU. You know, if our black children that go to black colleges, it's not that they can't go somewhere else. And it's not that they're, it's, got, it's not nothing to do with race, it's got more to do with, I understand you. I can talk to you, I, can, I feel you, I've been there. And those kind of stories are the things that I think resonate with most people. So I don't, I don't think it has as much to do about race with as me. I want to understand, I see a black kid that wants to grow up and be a banker, I'm interested in helping them. I want, to, I, want, I want them to know what the challenges they may face. I want them to understand what it takes, you know, what they have to do. And so I'm more willing to explain that. Now, growing up in banking, I had a lot of white mentors and a lot of people that helped me do the same thing. Mm -hmm. But I think on a more personal level, that is, that is what we can help black folks do. We can help them understand their situation and help them improve their credit so they can get in a position to buy a home get in a position to buy a better car that they don't pay 20, 25 percent interest rates for. You know, help them get away from some of the payday lenders that, that are entrapping them. Uh, that's our goal, that's our mission, and, and we're just starting, so we need your help. What are some of the other sort of urgent um, housing issues that we all need to be aware of? We're not building enough housing, uh, and if my treasurer was here, Sandy Doyle Ahern, I think there's not a person that I've met in this community, probably besides Christy Angel, who talks more about the housing crisis that we have in Central Ohio, and we have great organizations like Morsi who are projecting the number of people that are likely to come to our region, and we don't have enough housing as it is, and so when we think about um, what happens to individuals that don't own the properties that they live in today as we continue to get an influx of people? What we're already seeing is the rental markets continue to increase. So you have neighborhoods that used to be undesirable that immediately become desirable because they are the inexpensive places to live. And so they displace the residents that have always been there because again, in our free market, if I can charge $2,000 for the same unit I used to charge $1,000 for, why not? I charge 2000 the people that used to pay 1000 can't live there anymore and they got to go somewhere else. And so by not having the appropriate amount of new housing being built, you constrain the market. So we need to have housing of all types, not just affordable housing. That becomes a very, you know, uh, not in my backyard argument. We need housing of all types at all price points because the person that starts off as starter homes moves into the bigger home. And then that creates space for the person that's newly coming out of college or newly coming into the market. And that is how we create more opportunity and equity for all of our Franklin County residents. Another look at just housing and how that ties into all of the other social determinants of health. Because where you live and where you're born is gonna turn into the school that you go to, the education you receive, the healthcare access that you have, the food you're in or the food desert that you're in. And so all of the different impacts and determinants of your life can be determined by the zip code that you're born into. And, and, and that's not right, and how do we go about fixing that? So it's not just where you live, but we shouldn't be capping your opportunity just by where you're born. We should be extending those opportunities beyond that, and that's you know, probably a bigger topic for a different forum, but I don't wanna, I don't wanna lose sight of that as we look at, at housing being one of the critical parts there. Sure, I wanna come back to that panel. It's unbelievable for our school children, so mm -hmm. just think of children that are moving from place to place to place. They're the hardest ones to educate. They're the hardest ones to keep track of. Uh, they're the hardest ones to settle. Uh, they're the hard, when new kids go to a new school, oh, guess what, they're at the bottom of the totem pole. They are the, probably the ones that are gonna get bullied and kicked around and, until they fight back. But housing and stability are just critical, critical uh, parts of our community that we need to have stabilized so that we can do the rest of the stuff that we need to do. I do wanna say that we're gonna move to questions from our live stream and people here in the audience. If you have a question, make your way to the microphones. Um, if you're watching online, type your questions into the chat um, before we take the audience questions. I do have a final question um, about the growing black backlash that we are seeing in our country now against civil rights. We hear even more Americans um, saying that the history of structural racism shouldn't be taught in K through 12 schools, not even at the college level. Um, what is, which is really funny to me, coming from Ohio State. I'm like, really? Okay, it's my only editorial thing I'm gonna say. 
What are we in danger of losing if we don't talk about the history of redlining in this country? What Monica just brought up is the really important part of this is this isn't just a housing issue like understanding the history of redlining and the correlation that the redlining maps to have two current maps about higher inf infant mortality rates, uh, uh, reduced longevity and lifespans like this affects school, this affects uh, health this affects so many different things and again starts with that redlining and the prevention of people of color being able to generate generational wealth and so if we don't teach that if people don't understand the history of that they can't see the correlation to what is happening now and what we can still see and feel as the effects of redlining if we don't fully understand the history of it thank you for that um i think we're ready for some online questions laney thank you tracy mm -hmm. An online um, viewer asks, many older homes that come up for sale have illegal, racially restrictive covenants still in their deed documents. And sometimes there is even a covenant for the entire neighborhood. What can homeowners do to remove this language? I think that's a good question. I don't, I don't know what homeowners can do. I think they're largely unenforceable these days. I think the homeowners need to be aware of that. And that uh, there is a lot of still old language in a lot of the in a lot of the housing, but largely cannot be enforced. And I think homeowners need to be aware that that in, in certain areas they might see that language, but it's not enforceable. Legal process, they have to hire a lawyer to help them get rid of that language because some people like just don't want that in there, even though it, it's not enforceable. You just don't want to have that in your deed. So, but that's my understanding of it. In the auditors and recorders office in government, we maintain those records, and we don't change the records, but, but they are essentially unenforceable. You can change them. They do exist. We see them often when we're pulling records for records requests. It's, it's frightening and sad to see the language still there. It exists, but you're correct, not enforceable. All right, we'll take our next question. Uh, my name is Brian Urbanski. I'm with the um, Aubrey Affordable Housing Foundation. And our mission is to provide housing for low-income populations, especially those uh, residents returning home after incarceration. Uh, Mr. Miller, my question is for you. Many of our residents are getting higher paid, uh, skilled trade jobs. They're rebuilding their credits. And they want to buy in a lot of these redlining areas. Are there resources available out there that we can refer our residents to to prepare them for success and to make them as qualified as they can be before they come to see you for a loan. Yeah, and that's, that would be our policy as well. If they came to the bank and we recognized that they weren't quite there yet, ready to buy, you know, our, our goal is to get them the, is to send them through an educational course. So we, Homeport is one that's widely recognizable in Columbus here that, uh, that has great home training, uh, or mortgage training, I would say, to keep the, uh, the show people and educate people about the process of buying a home, the process of improving your credit score, and, and, and all the things that it takes. So that home buyer education programs are just so important. And, and it, does, it does help. Uh, and at a former bank I was at, we sent numerous folks to, the, to their program. And after, after they successfully competed, they were ready to buy a mortgage and we helped them. Thank you. Next question. Barb Smoot, President and CEO of Women for Economic and Leadership Development. This question is for Deputy Chief of Staff Monica Moran. You mentioned all the processes and bias uh, training for appraisers. Um, appraisers in general, that market is not ethnically diverse. Uh, when you reached out to firms, large firms, to choose uh, to, to do all the appraisers, were there in, was there any dialogue around what is the diversity of your staff and put some sort of requirements in place to ensure that you have a diverse group of leaders and a diverse group of appraisers involved in that process? Are there things that you learn from that um, that can actually help in future um, uh, initiatives? Yeah, so thank you for the question. A couple of things. Because of the scale and the size of Franklin County, there used to be only two firms that were able to bid on the scope of work that we had. Um, there, were, there were two large firms that could do it. So we kind of go back and forth between those two firms. 
I think there's a recently now third accredited minority owned appraisal firm who's working to who's, who's working to um, be able to handle the scope of, of a size of Franklin County and reappraisal. It is certainly a conversation we had in terms of diversity hires and working into the contract part of their training, part of, again, the, the bias training. We put that in our contract with our, with our contract appraisers, separate from what we do with our own full-time appraisal staff employees. Um, we're somewhat limited in what we can do because there's only so many companies who can do it, as I said, but it's, but it's been a very eye-opening experience and it's an ongoing conversation with the firm we're using. Because other two, I'm hoping for more, I'm rooting for more. Uh, I'm rooting for, I think that's a wide open market. Another thing we've been doing with our appraisal staff is working with Columbus State's um, Department of, of Real Estate and going and tabling at career fairs because really appraisal, to, to work in appraisal, it does not necessarily take a four-year degree, it's certification and training. And so I think that's a, it's a field where we would like to recruit and show, hey, come, come look at this field, come talk to some of our appraisers, join the field, because I can tell you in our office, it's real old and white. Folks have been there for a while, and you know, they're gonna be retiring at some point. We would love to recruit and train both in-house government employees who are appraisal staff, and then work with larger firms who are employing a more diverse workforce. But part of that is training and, and recruiting to the field and recruiting to the field more diverse applicants who, who want to go into the field and understand that absolutely they can do it. And I think that's something we could partner on. Absolutely, Jordan. Love to. We should. Yeah, I think that's, uh, <clears throat> that appraisal process in banks is what we call a round robin appraisal. So banks don't have any control over any of the appraisals that we do. So if, if a homeowner comes to us, we really don't have control over that appraisal. We can't change it. Uh, we, you know, it's the next appraiser up that's on the list of the company that we hire. They do the appraisal, and, and uh, if it doesn't work out, the homeowner can challenge the appraisal. All right, we have another question. Hi, thank you all for your insight. I'm Phil Flanagan with YWCA Columbus. Um, and you've touched on this a little bit already, but I'm curious, um, we talked about a lot of the harm, the residual harm to black, brown, immigrant families that was caused by redlining. Um, but curious to hear, you know, who is benefiting either financially or sociopolitically from these ongoing processes? And then also, um, what are some of the barriers to taking an equity, equity approach to repairing some of these harms and really centering the margins um, in our plans going forward? Always been profitable and that's why it continues um, it is easier for us to look backwards and say that these things happened a long time ago and absolve our, ourselves from the participation in them but to your question about who's responsible for fixing it they were policies that created these conditions and so to me it's policies that have to undo the decisions but oftentimes our policymakers need us as voters and as citizens to make them aware that we'll continue to support them when they put these policies in place. And I think Tracy at the end was asking the question about the backlash that we currently have in this country around talking about the truth about what has happened. And it is important that we don't allow that to happen because in especially a lot of uh, black and brown and, and immigrant communities, we don't even know that our neighborhoods were designed to be the way that they are. We think we created the problem because that's what someone else has told us. And so instead of being able to go back in the history and see that your great grandmother was actually paying more in rent in her dilapidated house than the person was in the uh, community next door because they had a VA loan that your grandfather was denied when he came back from war, when you say it that way, it's like, wait a minute. You know, this, this didn't just happen by accident. And so I think we have to have citizen involvement to let our elected officials know that we do expect things to change and that we'll support them when they introduce policies to create equity and repair the harm. Because again, became illegal in 1968, but there was no actual enforcement that went into uh, effect with that, so yeah. More laws that were passed and equally unenforced. So the 1970, after the 68 Act, there was a 74 Act that created Reg B, which is economic, uh, or uh, uh, discriminating against any kind of lending based on color or gender. Uh, and then in, in 1977, it was the CRA Act, Community Reinvestment Act. And now that's being revised and being talked about. But there's been a lot of changes to a lot of laws. And 
and the smarter people, especially at the banks, they find a way to get around them, to, to find a way to manage them to their best interest instead of sometimes their clients' best interest. So. Fast forward to today where we're seeing source of income discrimination legislation in cities across across the country, but we're seeing them even here in Franklin County where we're either trying to, to, to stop or support people being able to rent based on how they're going to pay for their rent. I mean, who cares how you're going to pay for it if you're going to guarantee your, how you're going to pay for it? If you've got federally subsidized funds to pay your rent, I would say that looks like you've got guaranteed payment. But we see you know, legislation that wants to stop people that have Social Security benefits or other type of, of subsidized benefits from being able to rent and provide a roof to their families. You know, in some cities fighting it, back to your not in my backyard. So we've got to look at even legislation like that for and against and make sure that we're, um, we're appropriately responding there. Thank you for your question. Hi, I'm Trent Smith, uh, Executive Director of the Franklinton Board of Trade. Uh, one of the projects that I'm pretty excited to see come to fruition that was recently announced is Vista Village, which is a tiny home village over on the east side at uh, Hamilton and Refugee. And I'm just curious for any of your thoughts on how do you view the role of tiny home villages like this in solving some of the housing crisis? And I'm curious also specifically, what kind of challenges do tiny homes present for like the auditor's office? Does that create a real uh, issue with the, the way we look at appraisals uh, when they're all clustered together? Or, and, and I also just want to know like what, what, what the panelists think about, are those a good idea? Um, I mean, I'm really excited to see this come to fruition. I want to see this one happen, but you know, we, we haven't done it in Columbus that, that way yet. So I just, I'm just curious about your thoughts on that. I'll start off, but in addition to working with the Kerwin Institute, we also did a partnership with Age Friendly, so we could look at homeowners and helping them Age in, and age in place because we know there's many who who have been in their house as I mentioned and you know paid it off and now they're looking at you know, people being priced out of their homes and we don't want to see that happen so in working with age friend we, we looked at how do we make you know resources more available and, and the tiny homes project was one that was brought up so one I think they've got some barriers in the different municipalities where they're building because there's zoning issues but two I would imagine and this is going to be my speculation here I'd have my speculation on it we'd have to treat those somewhat how we do how we do condos because they're individual residential owned units but they're but they're still their own separate parcels I think they've been handled differently and so you would have a small small parcel that someone owns um, I think in some places they were looking at them being rental units some as ownership so that would depend how the auditor's office looked at it uh, I I would support that because what we're seeing here is maybe a homeowner who had their you know, three bedroom home, their kids are gone, grown, went to college, they would sell it and scale down, but there's nothing affordable for them to move to, and that's creating part of that housing shortage. Maybe they would do well in that tiny home, especially as they're getting older. So if they could move to that and they could afford it, free up that housing for another family looking to move in, free up an apartment for a family who needs it, I think that's great. In terms of appraisal, it would depend if it's own or rent. I would think we would look at it as parceled out like we do condos, but again, it's a, it's a new territory. So I don't wanna, I'm putting that as my speculation and my best, my best possible guess how I would look at it, but I think for residents aging in place, for creating more housing, and for creating creative uh, alternatives to support our growing, uh, the growing housing need, it's a great idea. I looked at those early on when they were going through that project, and, uh, and I, I think it's a great project. Lainey, you have one more. So historically in Columbus, before redlining, there were neighborhoods where folks of different races and different economic status lived together, and research has showed that diversity makes for a better neighborhood. Do you feel a hope, see, dream of the day when we might return to that in Columbus? I do see it, and it is um, it is happening. There is there, there's some challenges with it, though, because it, it, when 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 blacks could live wherever they wanted, just think of it: the blacks who had the means could live wherever they wanted. The ones without the means had to stay where they were. So the the more blacks that moved, when I grew up, I grew up in Milo Grogan. I mean, our, our, our family was surrounded. We had teachers, we had educators, we had doctors or lawyers. They were all had to live in the same neighborhoods, pretty much. But when uh, 
when, the, when all this happened, they could move to the suburbs, well, they did. And the people that couldn't move had to stay, and those, those neighborhoods became very blighted. But I do think that integrated neighborhoods and children uh, meeting other kids, I think it makes a better place for them to learn from each other. All right. Well, thank you so much, panel. I think, could we give them a round of applause? That was a really great panel. And now I want to give you all the exclusive view of my competitor and I standing right here at the same time. Tracy's a nut, I love her. Uh, well, I hope you found today's forum informative, at times a little sobering, but also hopeful at times as well. I know personally, I was thinking back, um, I think I might have even first heard of redlining five years ago which is sad that it, you know, it's not something that was ever taught to me in, in high school or in college at any point. And I think that's something that we all need to come to terms with. It just, it needs to be taught earlier so that people understand the history because it's not controversial history, it just is. It's the truth, it's out there. So uh, hopefully it, it is something that uh, if people in your life don't know about, you can inform them uh, of the history of it. And if not, find that, that great display that I'm so glad you worked on. And um, I haven't had the chance to see it, but I know where to go now. Uh, and I know we put it on TV, and I, I, I'm so excited that it, that is out there for people to see in the public. Uh, well, thank you to today's sponsors once again, CODA, the United Way of Central Ohio, the Robert Weiler Company, and to the Grange Insurance Audubon Center for hosting us once again. Uh, thank you once again to all our virtual seat patrons and to the Center for Human Kindness and the Columbus Foundation uh, and the Columbus Dispatch for supporting today's live stream. A very special appreciation to today's speakers, Jordan Miller, Monica Moran, Nicole Sutton, and Danielle Sidner, and our host, Tracy Towns. And one more round of applause for them. <laughs> and thank all of you for taking the time here to uh, enjoy this community conversation, informing yourselves. Uh, we can't do this without you. Uh, feel free to make plans for next Wednesday's lunch forum at the Grange as we here from Columbus developer Jim Merkel on the incredible changes happening to downtown Columbus and the peninsula. Uh, it is quite the stuff happening over there if you haven't driven over there lately. And again, take a moment to answer that short survey in your forum flyer as well. Have a wonderful rest of your Wednesday. Hope to see you here at a forum very soon. Thank you.